Chapter 8, Wednesday, October 8, 1777. The 16th Massachusetts Regiment was camped on ground that sloped toward the Hudson. I resolved to keep a keen lookout for Trumbull and flee as soon as my belly was full. Eben jabbered a flood of stories about his uncle and his uncle's wife and all manner of cousins on both sides of his family, and thinking about cousins made him tell a story about his favorite plow horse. The boy could talk the bark off a tree. He didn't even pause to draw breath. Just as I began to wonder if his wits had been rattled in the, in the battle, he stopped in front of a dirty tent that sagged with damp. Best to store your kit in here, he said. We've had some pilfering by the cook fires. Can't trust no one, it seems. I hesitated. If I did cross paths with Trumbull, it would be safer to have my stolen treasure here and not on my person. But if I had to flee, how would I get back here to claim what was mine? The cook made biscuits for the chicken stew, Eben said. Are you fond of biscuits? My, vet, my belly voted louder than my wits. I dropped the haversack and followed him. Ebenezer Woodruff was an honest rebel. The biscuits were sand dry, but they were entirely free of worms and, and dirt. The chicken stew tasted strongly of fish. I ate two bowls and begged for a third. When a cook saw how hungry I was, he rummaged in his trunk and drew out a salty hunk of cheese that he cut in two pieces. Then he refilled our cups with cider. Does your cook always feed you so much? I asked as we walked away. I get extra on account if he lost a game of cards to my uncle last week. I must ask your uncle to teach me how to play. He won't. Says cards playing is a sin. But he plays? Uncle's allowed to be a sinner. I'm not. Look! He grabbed my arm and pointed somewhere at the crowd of folk who sw swarmed around us. There he is! Uncle! He shouted. Shh! I warned. He ignored me. Uncle Caleb! He hollered, waving his hat in the air. I found him, sir! His name is Curzon! Don't shout! I felt like every man in the army was staring at us. He didn't hear me. Evan placed, replaced his hat on, hat on his head. We'll chase him down. From within the crowd came a familiar roar of rage. My bowels twisted. Come on, Eben urged me. I need a privy, I lied, looking for the source of the trumble-like noise. I'll meet you at your tent. Eben grinned. Don't get lost. I turned to run in the opposite direction, just as Trumbull spotted me. Found you, you thieving rogue, he bellowed. I leapt over a cook fire, stumbled on a rock, fell into the ground, and scuttled on all fours like a crab past a collection of soldiers cleaning their muskets. Get him, yelled, tr yelled Trumbull. Stop that boy. A few fellows gave me a chase and caught me easily. Trumbull approached, snorting and steaming. He drew so close that I could smell his rotting teeth. Where are they? He demanded. Where are what, sir? I asked, trying to appear innocent. You know what I'm after, Trumbull growled. I don't know what you're talking about, sir, I said. He smacked the side of my head with his fist. My bloody spoons, whelp. The blow staggered me and a few fellows cheered. Trumbull grew, drew back his fist again and I raised my arms to protect myself. Sir, the sergeant, someone warned. All the soldiers fell silent and stood ramrods ram straight as the tall man strode towards us with Eben close on his heels. They had the same large ear, ears, high brows, and a long freckled noses. Eben had not mentioned his uncle was a steel-eyed sergeant. The man glared at me, and I stood straighter, too. "'What cause have you to beat this boy?' the sergeant asked my former boss. "'He stole from me,' Trumbull said. Four shoe buckles and a handful of spoons. "'Tis no concern of the army.' "'Is this true?' the sergeant asked. "'No, sir,' I said. "'Absolutely not.' "'He can't breathe without lying,' Trumbull grabbed my arm tight. "'I'll take care of the matter.' We won't bother you any longer. He's a soldier, Eben blurted. You can't take him. You're a soldier? The sergeant asked me. He wants to enlist, sir, Eben added, said quickly. I told you what he did yesterday. He's exactly the kind of fellow we need. In fact, him and me were just on our way to your tent to sign the enlistment papers. We were? The sergeant looked me over. What's your, where's your kit? Your gun? I know where it is, Eben said. Bring it to my tent, his uncle answered. You two, he pointed at Trumbull and me, come this way. The sergeant's tent stood with the other officers in a grove of birch trees with golden leaves. Before I could figure a plan to, of escape, 
Eben arrived, grinning like a lack brain and carrying a haversack and musket. He hailed his uncle, who was setting a piece of paper, a quill, and a bottle of ink on an upturned log. This is his. Eben handed the musket to his uncle and set my sack on the ground. The sergeant examined the flintlock. You took this from the redcoat who shot at Ebenezer? He asked me. Yes, sir, I answered. He could have stolen it from one of our boys, Trumbull said. The sergeant leaned the musket along the wall, along the log, and picked up the haversack. And this is yours, too? That broken compass was not a good omen, I decided. It was a curse. I believe, sir, many haversacks look alike. He untied the knotted rope and spilled the contents of the sack onto the ground. Shirt, stockings, blanket, musket, tools, knife, he listed, setting each item apart from the others. Drinking cup, tinderbox. He shook out the sack to prove it was empty. I see no spoons, Mr. Trumbull. Nor did I. Not only were the spoons and buckles missing, but so was the compass and Isabel's little bag of seeds. I'd been robbed. Trumbull frowned. He must have sold them yesterday. Search his person and you'll find the money. He was occupied yesterday, said the sergeant, fighting for the British. So fighting the British. Another lie, said Trumbull. This boy saved my nephew, sir, the sergeant said sharply. Trumbull spat in the dirt. Don't believe it. Hand upon the Bible, I swear, Eben said. I'd be dead if it weren't for him. We're beholden to you for that, the sergeant said as he bowed to me. He bowed at the waist, to me. Gentlemen bowed out of courtesy, out of respect. I'd seen thousands upon thousands of bows while serving Judge Bellingham and later his son. They bowed when greeting each other upon taking their leave. They bowed to ladies and to their elders. They did not bow to slaves or thieves or ditch scoundrels. But Sergeant Woodruff bound, bowed to me and I was all of those things. I returned his bow slowly, more deeply, to show I understood that the honor he paid me. Sir, I claim possession of that weapon, betrayed Braid Trumbull, to pay for what the whelp stole from me. The sergeant leveled his gaze at Trumbull. A soldier needs that musket more than you. He'll not enlist, Trumbull said. It's a ruse. Care to wager on that? The sergeant uncorked his ink pot and dipped his quill. What's your name, lad? I had the unpleasant sensation that I was about to jump from a fry pan into the fire. Chapter 9, Wednesday, October 8th, 1777. Uh, I stammered, um, caution was called for. I needed a name with no connection to me or my father or to the family that had owned us. His name's Curzon, Evan said. Likely another lie, Trumbull said. He's got all sorts of dark blood running in him. He could be an engine as well as a neger. He'll slit your throat as you sleep. I took a deep breath and fought the desire to beat and tremble skull with my musket. I grown used to his insults. They were, in part, why I felt no remorse at stealing from him. But to hear him call me such foul names in, in front of Eben and his uncle was hard to hear. That's his aim, I realized. Cause me to lose my temper and attack him, then he'd win. In that moment, I resolved to be a soldier again. I took a deep breath and spoke calm and refined the way I'd learned while serving Judge Bellingham's table in Boston. My name is Curzon Smith, sir. You're free to enlist, not a runaway from a master or indenture? I am my own master, sir. Trumbull wagged his finger at the sergeant. You'll rue this day if you enlist, enlist him. He's nothing but a bag of trouble. The sergeant pressed his lips together and drew a slow breath. If you do not leave this moment, sir, I shall summon the guard. Trumbull spat on the ground, turned on his heel, and stalked off, shouting to himself like a madman. I sorely wanted to stick out my tongue and make a rude noise, but it would not have been a soldierly gesture. What a foul-smelling son of the devil, Eben said. No cursing, Ebenezer. Now then, the sergeant again picked up the pen. How old are you, Curzon Smith? Near sixteen, I said which was not entirely a lie, for I would turn 16 the next October, which was only 11 weeks and some months hence. 11 months and some weeks hence. He scratched on the enlistment paper with his quill. Your regular pay will be 20 shillings a month. You'll be provided with two shirts, two pair of breeches, a cap, and two pairs of shoes when the state's shipment arrives. 
If you don't want the clothes, I'm authorized to pay you a cash bonus of $20, which you will receive from the paymaster at the end of the month. What about the land, uncle? asked Eben. Some say that every soldier will receive 100 acres at war's end, the older Woodruff said. I don't know how much truth there is to the notion. He dipped his quill again. Do you want to enlist for three years or for the rest of the war? Three years, Eben exclaimed. Only a fool would sign up for that. I weighed the choice. A ship would have to carry the news that we'd beat Burgoyne at the king across the ocean. Then another ship would have to sail back, bringing the British offer of peace. War would likely end by February or early March if the seas were rough. The British wouldn't fight after winter set in. The armors, armies would hole up in the encampments and wait for spring. That meant I'd have to place to sleep and food for months, along with new clothes and pay. I'd like to enlist for the rest of the war, sir. The sergeant scratched out a few more words. Can you write your name? No, sir. He handed the quill to me and pointed at the bottom of the paper. Make your mark there. I made my X with a bold hand. There now, the sergeant took back his quill. Private Curzon Smith, you are a soldier in the 16th Massachusetts Regiment, 2nd Brigade of the 4th Division of the Northern Continental Army of the United States of America. We keep our powder dry and our eyes open. Yes, sir. With that meeting, the others in the company and enlisting to the sergeant's rule, and listening to the sergeant's rules, it was near supper time by the Eben and I were out of earshot of others. We'd been ordered to go to the ammunition tent and roll gunpowder cartridges. I had more important business first. I stepped off the path and motioned Eben to follow me a few steps into the shelter of the trees. Where is it? I asked. This? He pulled my small leather bag from his haversack, but he did not offer it to me. Why did you hide it? I asked. That Trumbull is what Aunt Patience calls a dirty character, he said. But these are his spoons, aren't they? And the compass, too? I shook my head. That belonged to the red coat you shot, same as these boots. Taint right to seal, you know. I only took what Trumbull owed me, I said. He hasn't paid me any wages. Eben grunted. So this wasn't really stealing? Not at all. He handed me the bag. I figured it'd be something like that, but don't let Uncle see the spoons. He can be peculiar when the mood strikes him. I'll remember that. Thank you. We made our way back to the path. You going to the farm after the war? Eben asked. Zounds no, I vowed. I'm city born and bred. Why do you have seeds in your bag then? And that's a lady's ribbon. Who would that come from? Is she pretty? Is she waiting for you to come home from the war? I kicked at the rock on the path. You are overly fond of asking questions, Ebenezer Woodruff. I know, he grinned. Aunt Patience says it's one of my worst sins. Before. Isabel wore the ribbon around her wrist. She collected the seeds and kept them in a small bag made of waxed sailcloth. The seeds came from her home in Rhode Island, the garden behind the house she worked in New York, and a New Jersey field from last winter's army encampment. We'd stayed near that camp and found work. Isabel repaired soldiers' clothes for a seamstress. I was hired on by a cussmouth blacksmith who paid me poorly to keep his forge burning. We had started out as friends, Isabel and me, but grew to be more like brother and sister, mocking, arguing, and occasionally tormenting each other. I teased her about being a country bumpkin. She called me curse on because it irritated me and tried not to get me to explain the meaning behind my name, which I refused to do because of my father's advice. I did not like her to walk alone in the dark. She did not like me telling her what to do. Everything changed one day in April when I told a funny story about the blacksmith that made her laugh. The sound of it and the sight of her smile caused my heart to gallop and my throat to close up so that I could not speak. I suddenly realized that I did not want her to regard me as a brother anymore. Of course, I did not tell her that.